I am just going to tell you about uh, the Someone Project. And um, this is a joint project with Farm Sanctuary and the Camella Center. The Someone Project is really at heart an effort to introduce people or reintroduce people to who uh, farmed animals are. And it was originally termed the Someone, not Something Project, because most people think of farmed animals as, as objects, commodities. Um, we all have dogs and cats at home, um, and we don't see them as objects. We see them as some ones. And the question is, why can't we see farmed animals as some ones? Um, and so the object of the project is to actually change that, is to get people to see uh, farmed animals for who they are, actual animals, let alone, you know, animals we shouldn't eat. We, still, we just have to get them to realize that they're actual animals first. So this is what um, the research, the psychology research uh, shows, that most people grant regard for other animals according to their perceived intelligence and their similarity to us, which we believe is the same thing, right? So any animals that we think of as really intelligent or similar to us, we have more respect for them. Um, the, uh, but at the same time, most people view farmed animals as less intelligent than other animals. So there's the rub, there's the problem. Um, and because of that, they have less concern for their welfare. So it's actually the case, and, and this is something I discovered in my research, that many farmed animals are not even viewed as animals. They are viewed as something else, a commodity, an object, but they are not in the same framework as other animals. I mean, people study chimpanzees and dolphins. I mean, that's, what, that's who I study. Um, you know, dogs, cats, bears, etc. But when it comes to chickens and pigs, somehow they're in a completely different category, and that has to change. So how do we turn these misconceptions around? I mean, this is where we are right now. Which of these is not like the other? Um, was that electric company or Sesame Street? Sesame Street, right. So uh, Sesame Street, right? Um, there's the cow and the pig, and they are considered commodities. So when I first started this project, I was asked to be the science director because that's what I do, science. and. Um, for a while now, I've been very interested in putting a lot of effort into science in the service of animal advocacy. There's a lot of science that does just what it does, but there is no reason that science has to be the enemy of animal advocacy. It actually can be used to promote animal advocacy, and that's what the Camilla Center is all about. That's what. Uh, we're trying to do with the Someone Project. So what do we do with the Someone Project? Well, I, we go into the scientific literature, the peer-reviewed literature, and we pull out what we know from, those, from that body of scientific literature on the behavior, the cognition, the emotions, the social lives, the personalities of farmed animals. And by taking a scientific approach, I mean, you, those of you who are in the audience, you already know that these animals are intelligent and complex and emotional, but that's not true of most people. And so most people want to see that somebody says, pigs can do this, this, and this, and here it is in the scientific literature without any agenda. And that, is something that, you know, for some reason, I mean, people need to really understand from an objective point of view with people who are not, you know, trying to push them into veganism or whatever, exactly what do we know about these animals? 
from just the, and a purely objective point of view. So this someone project is providing an objective, verifiable, and yes, widely accepted way to achieve two goals, two goals. First, to place farmed animals in a comparative evolutionary context that recognizes their kinship with other animals apart from commodification. Who is a pig? They evolved like other animals evolve. They have adaptations, they have a brain, they have, I mean, let's talk about who they actually are in their own right without considering them within the, um, the welfare for pr production uh, framework. So there's a lot of science out there on the welfare of chickens and pigs, but a lot of it is framed within how can we get them to be more productive? Not who is this animal and, and why are they like that? The second goal is to educate people about who farmed animals are and why, like us, they are someones. So how can this project help to change the way society views and treats farm animals? Um, well, we've seen this growing shift in, in people's views about other animals. Um, we've recently terminated the use of chimpanzees in experiments in the United States, with a few exceptions. <laughs> Took a long time to do that for our closest relatives. Uh, but eventually people started to see that you know, hey, they're too much like us and they're too intelligent to be used in the kinds of ways that they're used. Um, um, I am, um, my main area is dolphins and whales and uh, recently there have been a number of, you know, developments and milestones in that area. For instance, the Declaration of Rights for them. Um, a number of workshops at the American uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is like the top science. So imagine, you know, talking about personhood in dolphins and whales um, to a, the scientific community. Packed room, packed to the rafters, okay? People want to know, and, and as you know, you know, this whole idea of keeping them in concrete tanks is now um, really on the way out and we're looking to put these animals into sanctuaries. So this is happening for a lot of animals and there is absolutely no reason why science can't be used to promote advocacy in the same way for farmed animals. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Someone Project. Let me tell you, it has been, a, you know, such a journey to learn about these animals. Um, you know, I've never, I've very, uh, I've, for about 25 years now, I've been studying dolphins and whales and primates. And um, when I was first asked to join this project, uh, I was starting to learn about farmed animals for the first time. Um, so here's where we are so far. Here are the peer-reviewed papers that have been published by Farm Sanctuary and Camilla within the project. Um, there was one published by Cool and Brown about fish in 2015. And then um, our team published a paper called Thinking Pigs um, in the International Journal of Comparative Psychology. We recently published Thinking Chickens and Animal Cognition. These are all major peer-reviewed scientific journals. I mean, to consider, I mean, I had to fight to get, to get them to realize that, you know, you use who, not what, for, for pigs and chickens. But when you finally see it in some place like Animal Cognition, Woohoo! So, and we have a paper coming out on cows in animal behavior and cognition in November. And we're working on goats and sheep uh, the rest of the, the year. Now, in addition 
to taking what we know about these animals from the scientific community and putting it back in the scientific community, framing it as, okay, these are real animals with a, compare, with a psychology, we then take those papers and produce white papers for the public based upon the science. Um, and here are, the th here are three white papers. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Samantha Pachirat um, on this project. And uh, we are developing um, all kinds of materials. So we have a white paper on thinking pigs, a white paper on thinking chickens, and a new paper coming out on thinking cows. And the great part about the, these white papers is they're basically the same, they're the same thing that's in the peer-reviewed papers, um, all objective science, um, but providing, providing it in a language that people can just pick up and say, oh, okay, I get that. So what are we learning? Well, we're learning that there is valid evidence for complex, cutting-edge, cognitive, emotional, and social abilities in farmed animals, self-agency, perspective-taking, planning for the future, reasoning, strong emotional bonds, and complex social structures. So, you know, if you work with animals, you already know this, but for the scientific community to say this uh, carries a certain Credibility that I think can only help the public in general to see who these animals are. So I'm going to give you some examples of some of the amazing things that I've learned. Um, and so the first example is about pigs and chimpanzees. Pigs and chimpanzees. So here's, here's what I mean by that. Okay, so one of the things I found is that a lot of things that pigs can do, chimpanzees and monkeys do, and when chimpanzees do it, we get all excited and we say, oh my God, they're just like us. When pigs do it, it just falls through the cracks. So let's look at something very complicated like perspective taking. Perspective taking, what is that? It's the mental capacity to put yourself in the mental space of someone else. It's the ability to know that your mind is different than my mind, and you may have feelings that are different than mine. Not only that, but I can kind of predict or figure out what you're feeling from your behavior, and I can also manipulate your point of view by doing something like lying to you, right? And a lie is not a nice thing, but it means that the person doing the lying is managing the information you're getting because they want to create a certain mindset, right? And so all of that is incredibly complex. It requires that you know that you have a mind that everybody else has a mind and those minds can be different and you can manipulate them. This is called theory of mind in the animal world and I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with that. Okay, so in, in pigs, it's all about pigs in their head saying, I know what you're thinking of doing. Okay, so what we found is that pigs can take the perspective of other pigs and use that information to manipulate one another. They are very scheming. And this is called Machiavellian intelligence. And you may have heard about it in terms of chimpanzees, right? Chimpanzees um, are, don't ever turn your back on a chimpanzee. <laughs> Um, I, I adore them and they're magnificent beings, but some of them can be quite deceptive and tricky. And they are known for their ability to use tactical deception when foraging with others. So if chimpanzees are out in a field and everybody's looking for a limited amount of good food, it's not just like they're looking, they're scheming. They are scheming 
And we know this from the way they act and the way you can set it up in an experimental way to understand exactly what they're thinking. And those chimpanzees are thinking, I've got to get to that food before the other guy. So what do you do? Well, you do all kinds of crazy things like, well, you know, you fake it, right? You pretend that you know the food is over there and you go over there and then everybody follows you and then while they're all over there, you run over there because you know the, where the food is, right? That's what chimpanzees do. That's what little human kids do. And that's what pigs do. Um, now, if you're a chimpanzee and you've been fooled a couple of times, that's it, right? You're not gonna be, you're gonna try to outwit the outwitter and so forth. And this back and forth kind of tactical deceptive strategies, chimpanzees and, and many other animals uh, are capable of. Well, when you see this, now you know what's going on in their minds, okay? It's not just a bunch of pigs eating grass. They are scheming. And how do we know this, right? Because you can't tell from just looking at them. So what you do is you take that scenario and you put it into a situation where you can control things and recreate what I would call the foraging pasture science style. Not very attractive, kind of sparse, but it recreates the major elements of what you saw in the pasture. What are the major elements? Well, a space to roam around, hidden food in different places, and a way to control what's going on so that you can actually interpret the behavior of these guys. And so what you do is you do studies, and these are a bunch of studies that have been done, where you release pigs into a science-style foraging pasture, and um, you see what they do. And you release them in pairs, because one pig knows where the food is, you've already showed them, and the other one doesn't. And you watch, what do they do? Well, the pig, who knows where the food is already, um, you know, Will he, will he go straight to the food? He might, but then the other pig catches on and is there saying, give me, I want in. And then the other pig has to deal with competition from his, his friend. Well, second time he's allowed in there, not gonna make the same mistake, so what does he do? He employs tactics like chimpanzees do to deceive the other pig. Like they might, it's hard to tell here, but they might go over to a corner or a place where they know there's no food really enthusiastically and really fast, get their partner to run over there and think that you know they're gonna steal the food, and then while they're partner's looking for the food, run over and get the food themselves, and then the partner has some anti-tactical deceptive strategies. <laughs> Who knew? These things are going on behaviorally if you just know how to set up the situation to actually see what's doing. What happens if I set it up this way? What happens if I set it up that way? And with these kinds of benign, kinds of obviously non-invasive types of research, we can figure out what's going on in their heads so that when we return to this, we have a different view of what's going on. So, this work was done by Mike Mendel. Um, and this is what he said about the pigs. Our results suggest that pigs can develop quite sophisticated social competitive behavior, similar to that seen in some primate species. That's huge for a scientist to say that, because um, scientists don't say things like that unless they really mean it and are really convinced of it. So these are some of the other things we have found out about who pigs are, that they actually can have long-term memories, they can understand a symbolic language. Okay, so we think, talk about chimpanzees and language studies. There have been studies of pig language, under, pigs understanding human sentences. Yeah, they get it. They have a sense of time. 
They remember specific episodes in the past. Um, so yes, all of you who know this on the ground, we, we now have evidence to show this without a doubt. They're great navigators. They're great at spatial tasks. Um, they live in very complex social communities. Not only do they make distinctions among one another, but they can use different strategies for each other. They have an understanding of the perspective of others. They exhibit empathy. Um, they show a form of self-recognition and self-agency in their ability to manipulate joysticks and use mirrors to find food. So uh, they understand how to use a joystick to play a video game. And that might seem like, ugh, so what? No, it's a big deal. So every time you go into a, an arcade and you play uh, a video game, it cognitively, it's a quite complex thing that you're learning that if I make this joystick move in this certain way, the cursor goes here and I can achieve a goal. And that's not something that every animal can do. Pigs can do that. And of course they have distinct personalities. So let's move on to another farmed animal, chickens. Chickens and chimpanzees. Okay, so now we're not even talking about mammals, we're talking about birds. Well, I want to say something about chickens, because this is the most startling thing I learned about chickens when reviewing the literature, and that is that most people don't think of chickens as birds. When you go back into the psychology literature and you ask people, think of a bird. They think of a crow or a parrot or a sparrow or a robin. Never do chickens come up? And if you give people a list of different kinds of birds, chickens always on the bottom. When people see chickens in trees, they go nuts. They're like, what? You know, they're birds. They perch. Um, and they see chickens as the least intelligent of all farmed animals, of all birds. They are on the bottom rung, okay? This is just what the psychology literature tells you. So we may see them for who they are. Most people do not. They see them for, as pretty much unintelligent things that aren't even birds. So let alone getting people to not eat them, we have to get people to see them as actual birds first, because most people don't. So here's an example of Machiavellian intelligence in birds, in, ch in uh, chickens. So roosters, as you all know, are quite the ladies' men, and they like to uh, vocalize if they've discovered food, and they put on this whole display. Um, and then they, so the ladies come around, and they're like, oh, this is a good guy to hang out with. He's got food and all this stuff. Um, well, roosters will sometimes create the impression that they are, that they found food when they haven't, okay? And they give all the vocalizations and they do the, the displays and so forth. Then the, the hens come running. And then he gets to corral them and protect them from other males and he's got his little harem there. Um, well, that's okay, but again, if you do this too many times, they're on to you. And if a rooster, a particular rooster, does this too many times, well, the hens are going to say, oh, it's him again, <laughs> right? He's, he's phony baloney. He's the boy who cried wolf. Don't go over there. And um, they, they're on to him. And they may use other strategies or tactics. So again, you have a rooster with a bunch of hens in a field, and you think, oh, OK. Well, you know what? All kinds of stuff going on where they're trying to manipulate their own behavior, their, their, their minds. And that tells you that they have a very, very sophisticated sense of who they are and how they are perceived by others. And that's pretty sophisticated. So it is now clear 
that birds have the cognitive capacities equivalent to mammals, even primates. This from Dr. Leslie Rogers, another, another scientist who's been studying them. And uh, it's, it's certainly the case that, you know, we can now say, um, yeah, chickens are very intelligent, and here are the studies to show it. So here are some other findings about chickens and about cows that um, I've learned. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how unintelligent I am. Okay. So, um, you know, chickens, some of the things we've learned are that they, obviously, they, they can do math. They add, right? Nobody knows what to make of this because they only do that when they're little baby chicks and then by the time they get to be adults, they lose that capacity. So what is that? Why would a chick have to come into the world knowing how to do addition? Um, we don't know. It's something to do with their ability to navigate the world, obviously, and to survive. But it's pretty amazing because they, they will add quantities. They demonstrate self-control and self-assessment. They understand who they are to other chickens. They can make logical inferences, OK? If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is greater than C. I mean. This is stuff we learn in elementary school, right? And these guys do this. They understand that when it comes to pecking orders. Um, they experience very complex emotions, both negative and positive. They experience emotional contagion and evidence for empathy. So it is certainly the case that they care about their kids, that it does affect them when something is wrong or their chicks are taken away or their chicks are in distress. Um, and, and so, you know, what's, what's important here is that, you know, we all say these things. When you put it to the test, you find that under the most objective circumstances, yes, they do. They experience distress when their chicks are distressed. And they have, you know, totally distinct personalities. I just finished the paper on cows. We're working on the white paper now. This, cows are, they're a different kind of animal, obviously, than pigs or chickens, but they also make very sophisticated discriminations among each other and among humans. They possess some very complex emotional capacities, like cognitive judgment bias. They can be pessimistic or optimistic, just like we are. Um, they show an emotional reaction to learning, which I absolutely, this is like one of my very favorite things that I learned, that they actually like to learn and feel that they've accomplished something. So how do you check this out? Well, you have two cows, and they both go through the same learning task. But one of them is just doing what the other one is doing, the other, and one of them is active, is actually, that's the one deciding whether they get to the goal. And the one that, gets, that decides whether they get to the goal, when they get closer and closer to the goal and they figure out, I've learned something, they start jumping around. And, I mean, it's just incredible. They love to learn. And, and that's, that's sort of an amazing thing, right? Um, Self-agency. They have distinct personalities and exhibit several dimensions of social complexity, including social learning. They learn from each other. So here's the take home message. According to even the most rigorous scientific studies, it is clear that farmed animals share many psychological characteristics with other animals, including humans. There is no justification for putting them in a different, qualitatively different category than other animals. And they are indeed someone, not something. More to do, lots more, including a call for research proposals. We funded a couple of really great research uh, research studies 
over in England on goats. I mean, what they're, sh what they're showing with the sanctuary-based work with goats, just incredible things that we never knew. So if anybody here, student, faculty member, anyone, um, has a proposal for um, a non-invasive, kind of voluntary, sanctuary-based behavioral study of farmed animals, contact us, send it in. Uh, we may be able to fund part of it. Um, and this is, again, part of moving everything from the lab, from the cage, to a more naturalistic setting where these animals can actually you know, sh demonstrate who they are. So I love reading research proposals. Bring them in, send them in. Thank you.